Thank you. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Ed. Um, I hold you fully responsible for creating a monster that you are seeing here right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and thank you for um, giving me this opportunity uh, to visit um, beautiful Australia. I had no idea it was a continent like this, that, that wonderful. Um, I want to talk today, this, so <laughs> this, this talk was listed as uh, for beginners, okay? So <laughs> it's, it's really funny, <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you feel like at some point that uh, you, you don't understand something I'm saying, you know, it's like, you're in the wrong place. Right? This is for beginners, uh, introduction to type theory. This is really, really simple stuff. <laughs> um, so why, uh, why type theory? So I usually talk about category theory, right? And, and this time I decided to talk about type theory, which is sort of a, a little bit of a step behind or under, I don't know. It's like the um, foundations of mathematics. But uh, as always, there is this weird convergence, like everything is converging with, with computer science, with programming. So type theory is also converging, uh, on the one hand being, being the foundations of mathematics, the new foundations of, of mathematics, on the other hand, something that we use every day in our programming, right? We have types and typed languages, although there are some people who think that types are not important, and programming JavaScript and stuff like this, but uh, uh, well, I won't talk about that. Uh, so um, here's a little outline uh, of my talk. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm just heading towards one thing that, that I found really interesting that sort of like I had like an epiphany about understanding uh, these identity types. Um, um, but in order to get there, you have to like find a, a path through uh, type theory um, and um, uh, actually sort of path from programming to type theory. And I think this is, this is probably the shortest path that I could think of. Uh, so first, first I'll, I'm, I'm, give you, uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of motivation, right? So like why, uh, so identity types are, t are about equality. What does it mean for two things to be equal? It's such a trivial thing, right? Um, um, and, but, but, but in order to express it in, in type theory, you really have to start from, from basics, from like nothing. Uh, so um, <clears throat> so these, these identity types, first of all, are recursive. So I'll start by uh, giving you an example of a recursive type, but present, very simple type, so you will all understand, but um, but it's presented in a way that type theorists do it, and, and they, they have their ways, right? Um, uh, then it's a dependent type, so I'll give you a little bit of a refresher on what dependent types are. Um, then I will tell you about induction, okay? Because once we have dependent types and recursive types, we can talk about induction. Um, and uh, then through propositions as types, the curry howard isomorphism, I will explain what is so important about equality types or identity types, right? And finally, I'll introduce identity types, introduce and eliminate them at the same time. And the, the elimination of identity types, that's, that's the interesting part. This is what I want, really want to talk about. And this is all uh, sort of leading towards what is called homotopy type theory. Um, although I'm not going to get into it, but, but it's a type theory and it's based on, it develops uh, equality types, okay? So motivation, right? Um, so uh, let's start by, by um, very simple problem. Uh, one times A equals A, okay? 
how does one prove this thing, right? Um, so, e, but, but in types, okay? So there is a type corresponding to one, that's the unit type in Haskell. Right? In other languages, they kind of sneak this type under the carpet, but in Haskell, it's explicitly a, a unit type. And product times, right, is, is a Cartesian product or a product uh, um, of pairs, right? So we create pairs. So if you pair A, which is an arbitrary type here, right, with unit type, what do you get? Well, you get something that's equivalent to this original type because pairing it with unit does not provide any additional information because there's only one unit, right? And it's always available. Um, so in Haskell, we would, we would do this by, by saying, uh, okay, there is, there is a function uh, from uh, this pair to A, and there is another function, so this is left unit, right? Left LU, as it works for all A, so it's a polymorphic function that goes from this pair to A, and it just picks the second element of the pair. Uh, trivial, right? And there is an, uh, the other function that goes backwards, right? Goes from A and just slaps a unit on it, pairs it with a unit. A unit is always available, so no problem there. Okay, um, so uh, I'm cheating here, okay? So this is what, what I would do normally in, in programming, but in mathematics, uh, they would slap me, you know, and they say, uh, well, first of all, uh, this, is, this is not really equality we're talking about. It's, it's isomorphism, right? Isomorphism means there is a function one way and there's a function the other way, and they are inverse of each other. Okay, uh, so I show the function one way, show the function of uh, the other way. I haven't shown that they are uh, actually inverse of each other, right? Uh, I could do some kind of equational reasoning on the side, right? Not within the language, but uh, eh, okay. So a little bit of cheating there, and I could show the isomorphism. I think the second thing is it's uh, like, so what does isomorphism have to do with equality? What is equality to begin with, right? Uh, so equality is defined as uh, if two things are equal, you can replace one with another in any context, okay? And that's obviously not true because if you have a function that takes an A and you try to pass it a pair unit A, the compiler will complain, right? So these things are not equal, even though they are isomorphic. So this is why equalities are important. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and we are not yet treating them very seriously. We are treating them as something on the side, you know, equational reasoning maybe, uh, and, and uh, replacing equalities with isomorphisms without really understanding why we can do that. Why is it okay to replace things like this? Um, so there is a whole theory behind it, and this is what I want to talk about, or at least give you a taste. I mean, it's like this, this would take uh, uh, a whole semester to explain, but I'll just give you a, a little taste of it, okay? So we'll start by uh, introducing to talk about type theory, I could start with like simple things, but uh, uh, what we really need is recursion, okay? Understanding rec recursion, rec recursive types. Uh, so um, let's start with natural numbers, right? So, um, so you pr you've probably seen the way natural numbers are introduced sometimes, especially when you introduce numbers Natural numbers as, as types when you do dependent kind of programming in Haskell. Um, I don't know how many people did some kind of dependent programming in Haskell using NATs. Um, uh, so you define natural numbers using uh, these two constructors, zero and successor, right? This is called piano arithmetic. Uh, but um, 
the, the way type theorists talk about types is they, they uh, th for every type, there is a way to introduce a type, the introduction rule, and there is the elimination rule. Okay, so these are the two important things. So uh, an introduction rule for us programmers means construction. How do you construct it? How do you create a function that will produce a natural number? So there are two constructors here, z or zero, that produces a, a natural number from nothing. So it's a constructor that takes no arguments, right? Zero can always be constructed. And, and then there is the successor that says, given a natural number, I'll give you another natural number. And it's sort of freely, uh, so that it's like a free construction because uh, you assume that what you were given after this constructor is a new number. It's like freshly new, minted number that's the successor of the previous number, right? And this is equivalent to all natural numbers because you can say, okay, I can produce a Z, uh, I can use the Z constructor to produce something, and I will call this something zero, okay? Arbitrarily. And then once I have zero as a natural number, I can apply the second constructor, uh, and I will get something new, and I will say, I'm going to call this one, okay? Fine. And, and then I apply successor to it, and I get something, and I call it two and so on, and I continue until I create all the natural numbers eventually, right? Um, uh, so that's, that's one thing. So you can, you can create these natural numbers, but that's not really interesting until you know how to eliminate them. Elimination means uh, I want to define some actions that take natural numbers, some functions. So mappings out of natural numbers. How do I map out of natural numbers? How do I define a function that takes a natural number? Well, since there are two ways of creating natural numbers, zero and successor, then when I eliminate them, I have to think of two ways of eliminating them. Like what do I do if when I get a zero? That's what I do. And what do I do when I get a successor of something? So this can be formalized in saying, well, I have a base of type A. So I'm, I'm creating a function that takes a natural number and produces a value of type A, some A, OK? Uh, for every function, this will be a different A. Um, so I have to define what this function does on, on 0, on Z, right? And that I call base. So that's just a value of type A. Uh, then, I, uh, then I have to have a function that tells me if somebody gives me a natural number um, and, uh, and some previously created value in the sequence of creating values, then I tell you how to get the next value. Okay, And that's called a step. So given base and step, I can now generate a function that will work for any natural number. Because any natural number is obtained from zero by applying a number of steps to it, right? So if I know what to do for zero and I will know what to do for every step, I'm done, right? So that's called the elimination, right? But there is also this part that says, well, once, once you have created this function, right, uh, uh, you can give me any function and I won't know whether this was created from base and step or not. So there is this uh, condition, and, and it's usually called computation rule, that says uh, the function that I give you actually has this property that if you call it with z, you will get the base. And if you call it with a successor of some n, you will get a step acting on f of n, where f of n is the func recursive call to the function. So recursion occurs naturally as the computation rule. This is where it comes in, right? There is also a third thing that uh, type theorists uh, often um, 
do is, is the uniqueness, like is, is the function, we, we won't worry about this, <clears throat> right? So, so this procedure of building a recursive function here is, is, uh, um, is written as, as a higher order function rec. So rec takes a base, takes a step, and produces the function that we wanted from nat to a. Okay, that's the result. This is the function. And an example, the simplest example is factorial, right? <clears throat> you take as your base a number one, and step is n plus one times x. So step is not a recursive function, it's just a regular function, right? Uh, that's easy to define. But these two will produce using the computation rule will produce you the um, recursive function that calculates factorials. Okay, so this is the first part, natural numbers. Um, as an example of what a recursive type definition is, right? Um, now let's do something uh, more interesting. Uh, let's talk about dependent types. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, instead of introducing a general, I'll give you first an example how you can work with dependent types. And this is an example that's close to our hearts. That's, uh, uh, um, that's the vectors, okay? Counted vectors, right? Uh, so counted vectors are dependent types. Um, and they, they define a family of types, it's not just one type, counted number, a counted vector is, is a whole family of types that's indexed by natural numbers. So there is a separate type for zero length vector of A, and there is a separate type for length one vector of A, and length two vector of A, and so on. Each of them is a separate type, you can't mix them. And because of that, you know, we have this power that uh, the compiler will tell us if we are doing something wrong with vector sizes, right? We'll match sizes and so on. Um, so I want to introduce this, uh, some, some family of types, and this family of types in this case will be the family of vectors, and this is, this is how you construct a vector. Again, com uh, it's very similar to how you construct natural numbers. You have two constructors. One constructor, nil, creates an empty vector. And then uh, cons, given an existing vector of size n, will produce a vector of size n plus 1. And some value of type a, of course, that you put in front of the existing vector. So you get a vector of size n, and you slap another a in front of it, and you get a vector of size n plus one. And the interesting thing here is that the, the stuff in red uh, tells you, well, so it's a function that takes um, n, which is a value, right? Uh, and takes types, a. And then vec a n is another type. And this type depends on the value that was passed before, the n, right? And the result also depends on this n. So this is this is equation in types, right? It uh, tells you what, what how types are created, but it has one one of the arguments there is a value. And that's what dependent types are. These are types that can depend on values. I mean normally we have types that depend on other types, you know, like list of integers depends on int, on, right? But here uh, it depends on, on values. But I really, uh, this, I, I want this type because I want, I want to show you induction. I want to show you uh, a, a little, a, a dependent, induction is a dependent elimination. So I, I'm still talking about uh, natural numbers, right? But I need these vectors to have a family of types uh, so that I can define a new way of eliminating numbers, okay? So I want to create a function that, a dependent function that would take 
natural numbers of, of arguments, but for every n, it would produce a different value of different type, right? Normally, a function produces a different value for different values, but here it produces different values of different types for every n. So that's what I want to do, okay? So I want to define a dependent function of natural numbers. And this is why I needed vectors as an example of, of something that I could be creating, right? So, um, and this is called induction. I'll explain in a moment why it is called induction, right? Like right now we are doing calculations. Uh, so you start with a type family, and the example of type family is this vector, uh, indexed by n. And just like before, we had base and step, but this time base and step is dependent. So it depends on n. It does not, b before we had base and step all producing something of type A, right? So it was the same type for base and step. Here we have something a little bit more interesting. Base produces one type, vector of size zero, okay? An empty vector. And step takes n as before, but it takes a vector of size n and produces a vector of size n plus one, or successor of n, right? And this is a different type. Before it was taking something of type A and producing something of type A. Here it's changing type. It's producing something of a different type. Okay, so for every step you will get a value, but it's a value of a different type. And then an example of a function like this, this is a very simple example. You, you have some value, uh, constant value of type C and you want to replicate it. So you want to be able to create vectors of size N that are filled with this single value C, right? So how do you do this? Well, uh, you define base. Uh, base is supposed to produce you, in this case, a vector of size zero. And the constructor for vector of size zero is nil. That was my constructor for uh, vector of size zero. So base is equal to nil. Uh, and my step will be, uh, will, will take a vector of size n and slap a C on it and produce a vector of size n plus one. So it, it changes the, the, the type, right? It takes a type vector of n and will produce type vector of n plus one, a different, um, different type, okay? Um, so this can be um, encapsulated as a recursive scheme that is, ty is dependent, dependent type, uh, and it's, it's called induction, okay? So we, what we did is, is define induction on natural numbers. And in general, so I, I used it for generating vectors, right? But in general, uh, induction is, is, is defined by uh, first defining some type family, which was vectors in my case. So given a type family C, uh, you give me a base, and a dependent step, and given base and dependent step, I can create a function, dependent function from nat to cn. So it's a function that takes natural numbers and produces values of different types depending on n. Okay, so it's more general than the previous recursive function, Right, where, where all the values were of the same type, A, here, uh, the type changes with n's. So in th is, is this higher order function that de defines, uh, okay, <laughs> for all, uh, right. So int is this function that takes base, and, uh, and takes step, so the second argument, second line is step, and produces this dependent function. 
right? And it has a computation rule as before. Uh, it looks almost, uh, well, it looks the same, right? It looks the same, but, but, but this, this is co a computation rule now involves different types at each level, okay? So this is, uh, so why, why am I calling this induction? Why do people call this induction? Okay, and this has to do uh, with uh, propositions as types, a curry howard isomorphism, that every type uh, can be thought of as a proposition, which is something that can be true or false. Okay, so uh, what's, what's a true proposition? It's a type that is inhabited, that has elements. Like, we normally deal with types that have elements, right? Like, Boolean has two elements, and integer has infinitely many elements, and, and so on. So, like, every type seems to be inhabited, right? Except that there's this one weird type void that is not inhabited except for the bottom, of course, right? Uh, but uh, we'll ignore that. Uh, so, so, what does it mean? Well, it, it means that well, there are some um, more complex types, like, like function types, you know? It's like you give me some value and I produce some value of some other type. Can I always implement a function like this? If I can implement a function like this, then it's proof that this function type is inhabited because I just implemented the function of this type, right? But if I can't, if it's impossible to implement a function like this because it doesn't have enough information or so, in its argument to produce a result, well, then uh, maybe uh, this is a, a not inhabited type. So a type that's inhabited is a proof, uh, is, is, a, is a true proposition in this language, and uh, every inhabitant of this type is the proof that it's inhabited, obviously, right? So it's a proof of this proposition. <clears throat> So this is the summary of Curry-Howard isomorphism, right? And then here's an example, like uh, the proof of a proposition that A and B, right, consists of a proof of A and the proof of B, right? What does it mean? It means that this proposition A and B is trans translated into pair of type AB, right, and the proof that it's inhabited, that this type of a pair of AB is by constructing this pair. And in order to construct this pair, uh, somebody has to give me a value of type A and a value of type B. And the value of type A is a proof that A is inhabited, and the value of type B is a proof that B is inhabited. So given these two proofs, I construct a proof which is a pair, okay? And in, it inhabits the pair type. And there may be many proof of the same proposition, you know, obviously, right? So how does this relate to induction, okay? So now we have, induction was like we had this type family, right? So for every n, we had a type cn, right? So now if we look at the types as propositions, uh, it means for every n, we have a different proposition. So there's a proposition that's indexed by n. And we want the proof that all these propositions are true, right? So we want to prove something for every n, uh, this proposition is true, right? And, and uh, the way we do this in type theory was we had this base and step. Now we, we interpret this base, since it's a value of type C of Z, right, C of zero, uh, then it's a proof that C of zero is inhabited, right? So base is the proof that C of zero is inhabited, and step is proof that C of n plus one type is inhabited as long as the type C of n is inhabited. So I'm proving that C of n plus one is inhabited using C of n, right? And this is exactly how we were taught induction in school, right? You have the base case and you have the step. And now we understand how, how this works in type theory. 
So this is what induction is. And this function ind just generates the proof for all n uh, c of n, essentially. So induction, now we have a new understanding of it. Uh, induction is just dependent elimination of natural numbers. That's what it is, right? So now we have all the ingredients to talk about identity types, okay? So identity types is, is, uh, is um, specifies that two things are equal, two values are equal, okay? So it's, a prop it's sort of a proposition that says, you know, given an X of type A and another Y of type A, are these things equal, right? So using Curry-Howard isomorphism, we could say, okay, so we have uh, the proof of equality should be like an inhabitant of a certain type because this is a proposition corresponding to, the, to equality, right? Um, so that means, so now you see why we need dependent types because for every X and every Y, which are values of type A, there is a separate statement, separate uh, proposition, is x equal to y, right? So I have to have a different type for every pair of x and y. And this type I call id of x, y, this type is either inhabited or not, depending on what value of x and y I give it. Right? So if I give it uh, x that is different from y, it's not equal to y, this type will not be inhabited, will be empty. Right? If I give it something that's equal, two values that are equal, and then it should be inhabited, right? I should be able to prove that it's inhabited. So now I have a type family, idxy, which uh, is parameterized by x and y, by values. So it's very similar to what we were doing with these dependent types, right? We started with a type family. Um, now this, this identity type is often, uh, I'm, it's in the beginning it might be confusing, but then you get used to it, is written in infix notation. So x equals y, now is a type. So you put this equal between the values that you're operating on. So it's a type that depends on x and y. And sometimes there is this uh, index A uh, signifying in what type we are talking about, like both x and y of are of type A, right? And now if, if somebody gives you a value of this type x equals y, this value is a proof that x equals y, right? Because it means that x equals y is inhabited. But they have to give you a proof for every possible pair of x and y. Or not give you a proof because maybe x is not equal to y, and then there is, does not exist a proof like this. So there are these, lots of these types, most of them kind of are in, not inhabited only the ones that um, are, correspond to equal values. So how do we, so now we have uh, a family of types. Now, how do we uh, uh, define this type, right? I mean, so the way to define a, a type was by uh, introduction and elimination, right? So how do we introduce this type? We have to have a constructor, something that would construct. Or this constructor would have to depend on x and y, right? Um, and how can we construct? We ha you have to construct it from something that we know kind of is true. And the only thing we know that is absolutely true about equality is that a thing is equal to itself. Right? It's a trivial statement. Everything is equal to itself. 
right? And that's called reflection of the, uh, as a property of, uh, of this relation of equality. It's, reflect, uh, it's reflective, right? Um, so so re reflection is the only way we can introduce identity in general, right? It's like we don't know anything about equality, but this we know for sure, right? X must be equal to X. So this is the only constructor of the equality type, REFL, OK? So this constructor is called REFL from reflection, right? REFL takes one argument, value, right, and produces a value of type x equals x, right? So x equals x is a type. And REFL is a value of this type, which serves as a proof. We can then use this everywhere as a proof. Hey, x is equal to x. And I have a proof of this. And I can pass it in my program you know, to everybody to testify that x is equal to x. It might so sound really crazy, right? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> but it means that everywhere I have an X, I can replace it with X. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, uh, here's, a, here's like a, a diagram uh, drawing. Like, uh, you, can, you can think of this like X and Y uh, on, on a plane, right? These are two coordinates. And they're like every point on this plane corresponds to a type uh, that x is equal to y, right? So if you have x and y, uh, x is equal to y is a type. So every point on this plane uh, corresponds to an equality type, a different type, right? And now I know that the diagonal, the types that sit on the diagonal, they are all inhabited, right? And they are inhabited by these values called REFL different for every point on the diagonal. Because every point on the diagonal is a different type, right? But they are all inhabited, and I have a proof of this. OK, so introduction is, is really a piece of cake. <laughs> it's the elimination of this type that's really, it's like, OK, so I can give you a proof of x equals to y, which probably means that x is the same as y because the only way I was able to create it is using REFL. What can you do with it, right? How do you define a function that takes a proof of equality of two things, right? So that's, that's the elimination principle. And the elimination principle is really, really weird. And this is why I wanted to explain it to myself. And uh, hopefully, I'll have, I will give you a little bit of, of intuition <clears throat> why, uh, why this works. Uh, so first of all, identity is this dependent type. It's doubly dependent on x and y. Um, so we'll be, now, I introduced these natural numbers, induction, and so on, uh, for the purpose of giving you an analogy because the elimination of uh, equality types is analogous in some ways to the elimination of natural numbers. It just goes like, way beyond that, OK? So when we were eliminating natural numbers, we, had, we started with a, with a f type family that was parameterized by natural numbers. So now we would have to start with a type family we have to define some kind of type family, capital C, uh, that depends not on natural numbers, but depends on these values x, uh, y. Well, depends on the proofs of equality. But proofs of equality it's themselves depend on x and y. Right? For every x and y, you would have to have a different proof of equality. So it's really a function of three arguments, x, y, and p, OK? x is a value of type a. y is a value of type a. p is a value of type x equals y. So it's a proof that x is equal to y. And that produces 
a different type for every XYP. So there's a family C of XYP. So that's, that's what the, there is at the bottom, right? So there is this family that's parameterized by three parameters. It's like a three-dimensional family. Uh, that is our starting point. So this, is, this corresponds in this analogy to our counted vectors. They depended on one parameter, n. This thing depends on three parameters. The, the important one being p, the proof of equality. So we want to eliminate these proofs of equality, right? So going by uh, analogy again, uh, for natural numbers, we had two introduction principles, Z and S, zero and successor, right? And for each of them, we defined like our starting point, uh, base, and step, which would move us from one natural number to another. Now, for uh, identity types, we only have one introduction, REFL. That was the only thing, right? So our elimination uh, should be a function of, of one uh, argument. So it's, it's, instead of having base and step, it just has something that's both base and step, OK? So what should it do? Well, it should produce a value. It should be a, so this step in the previous case, step and base, produced a value of the particular type. So here we want this to produce a value of a type that corresponds to the introduction. So introduction was only introducing elements on the diagonal, right, using REFL. Uh, so elimination will, uh, will uh, start by saying, for refls, I have a proof, okay? Give me, no, give me a proof for refl to begin with. And then I can extend it for every other equality. Like, you give me a proof, for natural numbers, you gave me a proof of zero, and you gave me a step how to proceed from one to another, and then I gave you a proof for every n. Here, give me a proof of REFL, and I can extend it to a proof for every equality that you can give me, right? So this proof for REFL will be a function, little s, right? That, uh, it's a dependent function, so it takes x as an argument, right? And produces a value of this type, this diagonal type, c of x, x, REFL x. Right? C was defined on the whole three-dimensional volume, kind of, for, for x's, y's, and p's. Uh, now we are just looking at the diagonal and, and saying this diagonal is inhabited, okay? So you give me the proof that the diagonal is inhabited. And I can proceed from there. So that's, that's the input that you give me. This is my step of induction, right? It's a sort of a little, very, very tiny step of induction because there is no movement in there. Like step in, in the uh, induction for natural numbers was moving you from one place to another. It's moving you by one, right? Here, this is a step that's not really moving you much. It's just constantly sitting on this diagonal. So combining this, the elimination principle for, for uh, identity types, is this, by analogy, again, by analogy with inductive uh, um, procedure for creating a function of n, right, which took base step and produces a function of n. Here, instead of base and step, we have this function that I called little c, right, that was um, proving that there is a value for every type on the diagonal, right? And then 
it produces a proof that this C, this proposition C, uh, or this type C is inhabited outside of the diagonal. It's inhabited for every x, y, and p, right? You see, it's like the result of this C is c, x, y of p. So it gives me a value of c, x, y of p. But it only gives me a value if I can give it arguments, okay? So, I, I mean, I can give it x and I can give it y, but it also requires this p, okay? And p is a proof that x is equal to y, okay? So, if I can't provide this argument, meaning x is not equal to y, I can't produce this value, okay? So automatically, like, if these two things are equal, I will produce a value for you, right? If these two things are not equal, I can't produce a value, sorry. You have to provide me the, the proof that x is equal to y. And there is a corresponding computation rule that you can figure out. It's like this, the function that's obtained through induction, right? If you substitute the original little c into it, you should get what you expect, right? If you substitute the REFL, right? Yes? I don't know what I expect there. What, what was it? Oh, oh, the computation rule. Uh, okay, so what was the computation rule for, for natural numbers? It means that if you substituted z, right, you would get the base. And if you substituted step, you would get um, the next value from the previous value. So here, uh, the only thing that you can substitute is you can substitute the REFL. Right? So, so int will give you this function from x, y, p to c of x, y, p. Right? So take this function, call it with x, x again, instead of y, and refl, which proves that x is equal to x. And you should get a value. This value better be the same as your input, which was the little function c, right? Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I get typos. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's renaming. I did some renaming on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for all. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello. Oh, that works now. Uh-huh. Need to shout. In the first one, I think you need a for all in front of the, just after the first arrow. In yeah. In front of your N of NAT because the scope of the ends on those two lines are different. Yes, that's true, that's true. This is a different N, uh-huh, right, right. Yeah, sorry, I was kind of sloppy. <laughs> yes, okay, last slide. Oh, perfect timing, um, okay, so, so this is, the, uh, th these are the formulas that you can like uh, read in, a, in this book uh, on homotopy type theory or on any type theory that uh, deals with dependent types and identity types, right? Uh, but what I wanted to do is, is give you a little bit of intuition how this relates to something that we already know, which is, which is induction principles, right, and dependent types. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a kind of mind-blowing generalization of the induction principle. Because normally, induction principle uh, tells you, well, uh, I prove something uh, for the starting point, and then, you know, you make a step 
And I give you a proof that if, if you were able to get here, then you can make another step and you'll get to the next point, right? So if you prove something for, for this place, you know, you started from Z, you got here, you know, all happy, uh, I'll tell you how to make the next step. And, and that's enough for you to cover all the distance to any N, right? But the thing is that this step is kind of discrete for natural numbers. And it goes from N to N plus one. So there is a, like a size of one between your steps. And that, that's what makes it easy. Where, with uh, identity types, there is no step, really, because you're dealing with arbitrary types. You don't know. You don't have a distance there. You can say you can make uh, a step like this, right? But before you get there, right, you, you have to cover half of the distance, right? So maybe my induction should be for half of the distance. But before you get to half of the distance, you have to get half of the half of the distance, right? You see where I'm getting? Like, it's, it's kind of Zeno's paradox there. Before you get, fr before you m make a, a, a journey from one place to another, you know, you have to make a little step. And the sizes of these steps, uh, there is no lower bound. There is no, like with integers you have one and you cannot go below one. Here, there is no limit. So every path from one place to another, and by the way, these equality uh, uh, types uh, are called paths in homotopy type theory because they, ha they, they have a model for this in actual homotopy where these things correspond to paths. So the proofs of equality are paths from one place to another. And what I'm saying is that I have the proof of equality on the diagonal, right? Which has to serve me both as a starting value and as a step. But what's the size of this step? The size of the step is zero. So it's like moving an infinitesimal distance and shrinking this infinitesimal distance to zero and you get a path of size zero, which leads you from x to x, right? And the fact that this works is, is just really, truly miraculous, you know? It's like, <laughs> you know, you, 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 get, you get this path, you shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, and because there is no granularity there, you shrink it to zero, and it still works. So shrinking this path to zero and getting refl it just gives you enough information to extend it to the whole path. Uh, so I'm going to end with this like <laughs> wisdom, I guess. You know, it's like every journey begins with reflection, which makes sense in this case of extending paths, starting from the proof, the minimum proof, which is reflection. Okay, thank you. <laughs>